A scientific discovery this evening. It is making huge headlines across the globe, something truly historic. Researchers tonight say they think they have finally discovered the so-called God particle, the Higgs boson particle, after the scientists who helped begin the search decades ago. But tonight here we ask, is this the bang in the Big Bang Theory? Well, what you see is the, um, some of the news headline. Uh, <coughs> in fact, uh, on the 4th of July 2012, the Higgs uh, hit all the news media and uh, pretty much all the uh, newspapers and any, every other uh, media outlet. Before I go into that, um, let me start with some, something uh, personal. Uh, my connection with the Higgs uh, started uh, 17 years ago, when I was a first uh, year graduate student and started to develop this uh, computer code called RESBOS. Um, in 1995, I, uh, I, I worked this out, and in 1996, already uh, the uh, uh, two Fermilab collaborations, CDF and D0, was used this code to search for Higgs um, boson in, in their data back then. Of course, uh, the energy wasn't enough. Uh, we didn't know what the Higgs mass was. Uh, however, in the last uh, 17 years, we developed this code, and uh, now it is used by the uh, CDF, um, the the uh, CMS, and and Atlas collaborations. And what this code does is it calculates uh, precision cross sections for Higgs productions. And you will see in a moment why that is important. But uh, before going, going into that, um, in fact, you know, you might wonder why a, the discovery of a single particle made, you know, all the headlines. Why, why was it so important? Because we have had to wait 50 years for it, or because it was called the God particle? Because it's just one particle. And um, there is a very good reason. There is a good reason why this is not just simply one particle. In fact, uh, it's a whole concept. It's a whole principle, and uh, and it, it opens a completely new future <coughs> in uh, in particle physics. And I would like to show you why that is. I would like to explain you why that is. Unfortunately, in order to understand the uh, significance of this, we have to understand a little bit of physics. And uh, so I decided to deviate from my uh, usual entertaining uh, colloquium style. And I decided to involve equations in this talk, which is very dangerous. I realize, I in fact uh, want you to do maths in your heads and I want you to work with me because uh, that's, that's the way basically I uh, will be able to show you why the Higgs is uh, so important. So, um, let's try this. Equations. So this slide shows you electrodynamics. <coughs> the first equation shows you the uh, Lagrangian of the electrodynamics, and you don't have to know anything. You don't have to know what the Lagrangian is. You don't have to know what the field tensor is. Um, it actually involves the electric and magnetic fields. The important part of this uh, whole slide is this. The electrodynamics as a theory is described by this uh, antisymmetric tensor. <coughs> and you can see the antisymmetry looking at these indices. If you interchange the mu, yeah, new index, then uh, the, the tensor will switch side. side. That's, all, that's all you have to understand about electrodynamics. All electrodynamics are, are, is described by this uh, antisymmetric tensor. Now, electrodynamics has a curious property called gauge invariance. 
And what that means is the following. You can change the field. Actually, this is, this is the photon field eventually uh, we learn. You can change this photon field, you can shift it. And the theory remains the same. In other words, this, this photon field is not really a physical thing, it's only physical to a shift in the derivative, with, with the derivative of an arbitrary function. <coughs> and this is very important, that you have a derivative here, and, f, and phi is just an arbitrary function. Now this is where, where you have to do maths in your heads, and you have to do basically tensor algebra in your head. I'm going to help you with that a little bit. Imagine sticking this new field, which is, which is the old field, shifted by uh, some uh, derivative of an arbitrary function. Imagine sticking that in here. So defining a new field strength tensor. Of course, the first term just gives you back this with the time. <coughs> but it, actually, the first term gives you back exactly this. But then the second term, this term, when you stick it here, it gives it d mu d nu, because this index becomes nu d mu d nu phi, and here you get a d nu d mu phi from this second term. So many of you recognize this, that uh, the minus sign is going to kill the two terms. There's a d mu d nu phi, and there's a d nu d mu phi. From the antisymmetry of this original tensor, the phi term just falls out. And what you conclude is that electrodynamics is unchanged under the shift of the field by a full derivative. Isn't, it, isn't this nice? Okay, when, when, uh, when people recognized this um, 100, 150 years ago, they didn't know what to do with this. This was a curious uh, um, property, and at this point it really means nothing just in itself. But <coughs> try to remember this. Electrodynamics respects a symmetry where you change the field with a full derivative. <coughs> I'm actually pushing my luck quite a bit. Because trying to teach electrodynamics now I switch and I'm, I'm trying to teach you uh, quantum mechanics. You don't have to know anything of the quantum of this Dirac Lagrangian. The only thing you have to understand there is that the quantum mechanics is formulated in terms of the wave function. So the wave function of course appears in its Lagrangian and it appears all over the theory. And the wave function has a derivative term in the Lagrangian that will become uh, important later. So those of you who have ever heard about the wave function, you know that it's a complex function and its phase is non-physical because the absolute value of the wave function, absolute value squared, gives you some physically measurable thing. And so uh, shifting the wave function by a phase leaves this this expression invariant. Interesting. See, interesting. It's very similar to what we saw in uh, electrodynamics. You have a symmetry of the uh, fundamental entity under not a, not a simple shift, not, not a simple shift by derivative, but a shift uh, of the phase. So you have these uh, curious symmetries floating around in electrodynamics and in quantum mechanics and around, two around uh, 100 years ago basically nobody knew uh, 90, 80 years ago nobody knew how far these, these uh, symmetries will lead roughly 60-ish uh, years ago Feynman, uh, Schwinger, and Tomonaga wrote down a combination of quantum mechanics and electrodynamics. And that was quantum electrodynamics. And I am so uh, ambitious here 
that I am going to dive into that. Because, come on, we already understood that, that electrodynamics is beautifully symmetric on the uh, shift of the field with the derivative. And we know that the, that the quantum Dirac uh, Lagrangian is invariant on the phase shift of the, of the wave function. So we can put them together and, and, and then just do quantum electrodynamics. Why not? Lagrangian is in front of us. And then we can try to shift the, uh, the photon field in here. And we know that the shift of the photon field leaves this term invariant. There is no photon here. And then the shift of the phase shift of the, uh, of the electron field leaves this term invariant. So do we have invariants? Well, almost. Let me make something explicit. Here, the derivative, of course, acts on this phi field, phi, phi uh, function, let's just call it that way. And then, uh, of course, if the phi is independent of space-time, then the derivative is zero, so there's no, no any kind of shift. So it's understood that this phi depends on space-time. What happens if this phi depends on space-time? Then, um, when we stick this phi into here, then we will have two terms. We will have a, you know, this shifted, shifted thing we, we just stick in there. We will have two terms. We will have a derivative on phi, <coughs> and then this term will also produce a derivative on phi. And that's a problem, because then invariance is ruined. So interesting, quantum physics is invariant under a shift something like this. Electrodynamics is invariant under uh, the um, shift of the, of the uh, field. But quantum electrodynamics with this uh, so-called local uh, gauge invariance fails. There is no, no, uh, there is no symmetry there. And that's a pity, because, um, because it seemed that it worked so well. It seemed that we were up to something, and now it seems that the whole thing is collapsing. However, if you stare at this for a while, you see that, uh, yeah, for uh, 50 years or something, <laughs> you, you realize that um, the extra term, the derivative acting on this phi, is already here. The whole whole bunch of derivative of phi terms uh, floating around in this field. So why don't we stick an A field next to the derivative so that when the A shifts, it produces a derivative of phi, and then when this acts on that, it produces a derivative of phi, and due to the minus sign, they just they just cancel. Okay, so so far I think you think that I'm completely crazy because I expect you to understand all this mathematical uh, mumbo jumbo, and then uh, the whole thing has nothing to do with anything. <laughs> However, now we have invariants, and now we can ask physical questions. Look at what you just did. Um, you have a wave function, you stop this uh, photon in there so that you have invariants. And then you have another wave function here. This is a, an electron, more precisely, positron photon electron interaction. What we did is we derived <coughs> quantum electrodynamics, we derived the force, we derived the quantum version of the electromagnetic force, just insisting that this Lagrangian is uh, symmetric under this uh, gauge invariance. We derive this interaction. What we did is uh, we went from the symmetry and we got a force out of, out of the symmetry principle. And this is huge. This is really huge. Because this cannot, you, you, can, you can do this for every known forces. 
what I showed you it was a was a Mickey Mouse sketch of the Yugon Keijin variance. In reality, actually, it works much more complicated way. But um, but I was trying to show how how a simple combined <coughs> phase and and um, and gauging variant leads to uh, the electromagnetic force. And it turns out that the weak force and the strong force and even gravity works exactly the same way. In fact, uh, Wilczek used to show similar. Um, we check out the Nobel Prize around uh, mid 2000s, uh, mid 2000, around 2005, and uh, he um, he used to show a similar diagram, a uh, similar uh, slide, and pointing out that look, nature, how how simple, how simple nature is. Nature is like one, two, three, and actually four for that matter uh, <coughs> with the uh, with the simple linear group. So uh, you can just gauge these, uh, these uh, symmetries. You got these forces out. And th there is nothing Mickey Mouse about that. This is exactly what we do in, in particle physics. We insist on certain symmetries. And you can even do gravity. You can write out the gauge, gauge theory of gravity uh, gauging uh, the, uh, the um, special linear group. And you cannot not renormalize gravity, so that everybody knows that there is a quantum gravity problem. However, the recipe works. The recipe works for all the forces that we know. This is really amazing, because if you played the latest version of uh, Star Wars, a computer game, the weapon of choice would be the gauge principle. <laughs> Remember this next time when you are playing it. Because once you have the gauge principle, that means from the symmetries, you can control the force. And once you have the force, you can do anything. This is how powerful this is. This is how you know, the gauge symmetry in, in court encapsulates all the essence of known particle physics. It's, um, it's, it's, it's really powerful. So, there is more. Because uh, what I told you so far was absolutely speculative uh, mathematics. It had nothing to do with nature. There were a bunch of formulas. So what? What happened in 1983 is that the W and Z bosons were discovered, which spectacularly confirmed that the weak interactions are indeed gauge interactions, because the uh, mathematical formulation predicted the W and the Z boson. W and the Z boson are the gauge bosons of the, of the weak interactions. And uh, the, the gauge formulation of, of the weak force predicted them. And in a few years, they were found at uh, CERN. So by then, everybody knew that all the forces are indeed coming from symmetries. Because uh, the photon was known. The photon is the, uh, is the gauge boson of the uh, electromagnetic interaction. Nobody have ever seen and will see a gluon itself, but we know that it's there. And the graviton, some people are working on finding the graviton gravitational wave. So, uh, <coughs> so now everybody could have been happy. In fact, uh, the CERN people went as far as even measuring the mass of the W and Z, and they came up with these numbers, and that could be the end of the story. Beautiful, we understand everything. We understand all the forces, we understand the universe. So, what's the problem? Well, there is a problem. As usual, the discovery of the W and Z answered the question, 
where do forces come from? However, it raised several other questions much worse than the original question. And the first and most <coughs> important of them was the following. How can the W and Z have mass when gauge invariance itself, the gauge principle itself, for the mass for W and Z? And this is a huge problem. The gauge principle predicts W and Z, but in the same time it, it forbids their masses. W and Z cannot have a mass with, with gauge symmetry intact. And here is the mathematical way to understand that. Try just to stick a mass term into this uh, Lagrangian, and then now, now, now this W is the gauge field, so it, it just transforms as, as the photon transforms. So then shift, shift the gauge field with a full derivative. All this is invariant due to the clever construction <coughs> that I went through. You don't have to worry about it. However, when, when W prime hits these spots, then it gives you back a mass term, and then it gives you some really big mass of, uh, of, that, of, of, uh, of derivatives of phi. And those derivatives of phi just contribute to this L, and it changes the form of the L, so there is no invariance. And the very mass of W and Z ruined the beautiful gauge symmetry that, that they were predicted from. And that's a, that's, a, that's, that's a problem. That's a problem because now you have, a, you have a theory which makes no sense anymore. You have the most powerful theory that basically ever was written down. And then you just ruined it or experiment or God ruined it just giving us W and Z mass. So now what? Because the W and Z mass are experimental uh, facts. You cannot insist on this anymore. You have to throw away the whole idea. But if you throw away the whole idea, you don't understand anything anymore. So that was about the time when uh, Higgs and the other uh, five gentlemen entered the game. And what they did is uh, the uh, principal motto of any particle physicist. <laughs> if you are in trouble, just start another particle. I mean, we have already a zoo of particles. Who cares about one more particle? So let's add the Higgs boson. <coughs> it's easy to uh, get rid of these terms coming from this, uh, this mass term. Because we already get rid of delta phi or, or the derivative of phi terms here, so we know that we know, we know how to do that. You just you just introduce yet another term next to the original um, original um, mass term, such a way that uh, its its um, its transformation property will just cancel the unwanted uh, derivatives of phi. Why not? I mean, we did it here. We, we, we did it uh, when, we, uh, when we achieved this gauge invariance of this, uh, of this original equation. So why not cleverly inject another term here such a way, and then the, <coughs> find its transformation property such a way that uh, the unwanted uh, terms coming from the shift of the gauge field cancel in the master. <coughs> and then you have a beautifully invariant Lagrangian again gauge invariance is restored, the power you know, in, 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 in the force is, uh, is, is, uh, is not disturbed anymore, so you can go through with, uh, with uh, your computer game, you can generate the force, you can control the force, you have everything. That happened about 50 years ago. But that was the idea. Look at this, look at this. This is absolutely the cartoon Mickey Mouse version of the actual Higgs mechanism. Look at this, this is so complex, there is nobody in this room who would believe that this is true. This is some mathematical mumbo jumbo 
what are the chances that this new hypothetical particle exists? There is no chance. There is, there is, there is no chance in that. That was 50 years ago. This was one of the theories amongst many competing theories of how to, how to, uh, how to uh, resolve the, the gauge uh, principle conflicting mass, gauge, gauge boson masses problem. And there were many other solutions, and uh, there were Higgs-less solutions, and there were solutions with, in, involving other particles. And nobody knew what, what was happening for about 50 years. Of course, uh, it's not easy to talk about these things when you know the punchline. However, you have to respect uh, and, and appreciate the, the, the size of the problem and, and, and the confusion that uh, we all had. The way out, uh, now looking at this Lagrangian, might be the following. If you could see this interaction between W's and Higgs's, W's and Higgs, uh, if you could see such an interaction, or if you just could see a Higgs boson for that matter, um, that would save the game because that would sort of uh, confirm this whole uh, hypothetical, mathematical, uh, Phantasmagory. And the truth is that uh, 17 years ago, when I started to work on this, I didn't believe any of this. I um, I will comment on that in a moment. So people still started to think, how could we make a Higgs? Let's just make a Higgs. The Higgs should prove that this whole thing is correct. And what do we know about the Higgs? The Higgs couples to particles with mass. I mean, from this Lagrangian, you can read it off. In fact, we, we, we read it off. Uh, this, this only happens in the mass terms. And so this part, particular coupling will only happen with particles with mass. And it couples, the, the coupling constant here is, is just proportional to mass. Uh, WWX coupling is proportional to W mass. So that's good, that we know. The problem is the following. Anything that exists in this room, electrons, up and down quarks, protons, they have very little <coughs> mass compared to Ws and heavy quarks, and photons and gluons, which we have plenty of. The, 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 the proton is full of gluons, half of the proton is gluons photons are all over the place. They just don't couple to, to Higgs. So all the matter that we have hardly couples to the Higgs. It, so, 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 so how do we make a Higgs in the lab if the interactions of the Higgs with us is, is negligible, are negligible? There were whole books written on this. <coughs> so uh, this is one of the most famous of them, Higgs Hunter's Guide, a 500 page book, just trying to figure out how to make a Higgs, how to create, how to uh, detect the Higgs, and so on. My uh, academic grandfather is one of the authors. Gordy uh, won the bet eventually against uh, Stephen Hawking. He won the hundred dollars from St Stephen Hawking when the uh, LHC found the Higgs, and uh, I had it wasn't a purse, it wasn't a bet with Gordy, but uh, I had many conversations about this uh, while, I was, while I was at Michigan, while I was a student, and uh, I told him, "Look, Gordy, I mean, looking at this mathematical formalism, I just don't believe that anything like the Higgs could be there." He he counterargued a lot of times that, "Look, the alternative solutions are even more." Terrible. They they look even <coughs> much more complicated, and then they invoke much more stuff than than this Higgs mechanism. And um, I told Gordy that look, I, I just cannot believe this. And he told me the following: Chaba, we will find the Higgs. I promise. <laughs> I remember in um, 
1998, he, he, he told me this. And I told him, look, I don't believe it. I, I will only believe it if uh, experimental collaboration will show me that this Higgs boson exists at five sigmas. And so in July, I saw that. But stepping back before July, um, the way to make a Higgs is the following. Take a proton, proton is full of gluons, take two of them, collide them, um, get a virtual top loop. The top quark is, is extremely heavy, it couples to the Higgs like crazy, bang, there's a Higgs boson. The other way, take, take two quarks from each, each, each from a proton, and then uh, make them exchange a heavy boson. <coughs> heavy boson is heavy, couples to the Higgs, bang, there's another Higgs. So uh, there are other ways, but it doesn't matter. In importance, they are listed. This is the highest, way highest procession, cross section for this is 10 times lower, and so on. So this is the way to make a Higgs. Okay, so that's easy. Take, take, take two, two protons and just keep colliding them at high enough energy. So we didn't know that Higgs mass, so we didn't know how high energy we have to go. <coughs> so we tried this at Fermilab, uh, it didn't work. Uh, that, that's what brought me into the uh, Higgs game. Um, but um, now let's just, let's just look at the other end, namely if you create a Higgs, then what? Then it turns out that from the Lagrangian which I wrote down, you can calculate what the Higgs does after it's there in the collider, and then it and then it decays mostly into a pair of bottom and anti-bottom quarks, because they have the biggest mass um, amongst uh, the quarks that uh, kinematically is allowed. It's, uh, it's, it's not going to decay into two, two tops unless it's uh, way too heavy. So so mostly the the, the light Higgs uh, here, yeah, in this whole range. Light Higgs uh, decays to two bottom quarks or into two Ws. In fact, almost in the order of mass. This is this is how uh, the Higgs decays. So it's just couples strongest to the to the most massive stuff. And down here, like almost three orders of magnitude down here, the Higgs actually decays into two photons through uh, a similar uh, diagram <coughs> like this. If you reverse this for a moment, the Higgs um, through a top loop. Uh, creates two photons um, because the photons, of course, uh, couple to the charge of the uh, top quark. And it turns out that at both both um, both at uh, the large hero collider and and at uh, at the uh, Fermi of Tevatron, the, these these decay modes into tau and especially gluons and and quarks. They just create so many jets flying around that you wouldn't see what's happening amongst any other jets. Uh, so it turns out that the cleanest way to see the Higgs boson is, 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 is this, is this skimpy little uh, diphoton uh, ray. So we understood that um, roughly 10 years ago, and uh, we, we had lot, lots of practice at Fermilab, and um, in Resbos, in fact, we, we started to focus on, on the diphoton rate, and we uh, we we uh, we worked on this uh, this Higgs to diphoton quite a bit. We didn't know the Higgs mass. The Higgs mass could have turned out could have turned out somewhere here. We were lucky actually guessing Higgs mass is going to be around 120. So. Um, just to show you <coughs> a clean Higgs event, looks like this, and this is this is uh, the Higgs going to two Zs. This is a clean event, so you don't want to have the the messy Higgs going to BB bar or something, because that that it's impossible to decipher what's what's happening in the in the event. So uh, you just make. Uh, billions of collisions per second for several years at, at enough energy and if you are lucky and if the Higgs is there you will see it. And that's exactly what happened. So on 4th of July 2003, uh, I'm sorry, 2012 presumably, 
this year. The, uh, the CMS collaboration and the ATLAS uh, showed us this uh, Higgs uh, signal. This is the bump. This is where the Higgs uh, resonance is, uh, is uh, seen. And if there was no Higgs, the data should be consistent with the, uh, with, with the standard model background, uh, which Presbo also calculates. And, uh, and then it was just there. So, um, so, um, so that's, uh, this, what, what this what is shown here is exactly the, uh, the gamma gamma uh, final state. So these are photons, and these particular photons uh, come from the Higgs. And these, these photons just come from uh, other, other uh, mostly QCD processes. So, of course, that bomb doesn't tell us whether we have a Higgs boson. It doesn't tell us. Because what it tells us is that there is a new particle at 125 GeV, which decays into two photons. But that's, that's not enough. I mean, it doesn't mean that it's enough. And it doesn't tell us which Higgs it is, even if it's a Higgs, because now, by now, there are dozens and dozens of different uh, theories, supersymmetric Higgs and extra-dimensional Higgs, and God knows what. So there, are, there are many different Higgs, so we don't know which Higgs it is. And we don't know what else might be lurking in that data. So how do, how do we answer these questions? It's going to be the standard model Higgs. There is another way of look at, looking at the same thing. And never mind what's all this. If this is a standard model Higgs, then um, <coughs> on this particular axis, it should lie in the, in the blue point, where basically they are all, they are all this, this variable is constructed that they are all uh, lying on the zero point. Look at these error bars. Uh, the error bars, of course, come from calculations that people do in the standard model. And this is where the power of response can be appreciated. The error bars are shrunk. If you can do a more precise calculation, then you have a smaller theoretical error bar. And now you see why it is useful to have these uh, precision cross sections. Because is there a difference between the measured and theory? Well, you don't know, because the error bars are too big. But if you can shrunk the error bars, then you might see that uh, this is not the standard model. This is, of course, the data. The yellow is the data. Don't look at the red. The, the, the blue, the theoretical calculation, should overlap with the, uh, with the yellow. And at this point, they pretty much overlap. Blue and the yellow overlap within the one sigma error bars. Um, again, it's some tau related stuff, which is the only one which doesn't overlap, and that um, that is based on very few events at this point, um, even uh, even even uh, the updated uh, case. So, um, looks like we have a standard model Higgs on our hands. At least it's completely consistent with a standard model Higgs. There was a lot of activity, dozens of papers focusing on just this tiny little discrepancy. Because what happens is the following. The way to make two photons from a Higgs is because the Higgs doesn't directly couple to the photons, because photons are massless. So you have to involve some massive stuff in between them. And the way to involve massive stuff in between them is just put the, put, put a loop. And so the Higgs uh, typically through a loop decays into two photons like this. And the standard model expectation is somewhere here. And then this is the central value. So how can the measured value be different or larger than the standard model stuff? The standard model Higgs coupling here is exactly fixed by standard model. So it Higgs couples to the, to the uh, massive stuff through the mass. So the mass of these you cannot tweak, because we know what the W and C and top mass is. Everything else is, is exactly fixed by the standard model. So there's nothing, nothing to tweak here. Um, the only thing you can do to enhance this thing 
is to introduce, and you will probably laugh, yet another new party. If you are willing to introduce a new loop, a party call which, which creates yet another loop, then, then this can be enhanced, then this type of rate can be enhanced. And amazingly, it turns out that supersymmetry predicts particles which would float. In fact, those are the super partners of the, of the W's and, and, and the top, which actually float around here automatically once you insist on supersymmetry. And then they can enhance the, uh, the dive photon production. So people are now sort of bending backwards to see whether this is a hint for SUSY or possibly for other, phys other new physics, other new uh, exotic particles floating around here or not. Of course, this is way, way too early to decide because this, this, this data point can move back and forth so yeah, anywhere in this blue region, but even further probably. And this, this, uh, this experimental error bar has to be shrunk down. To, to conclude of any, any of this. But what happens is that right now, what we see is also consistent with supersymmetry. There is a problem. Of course, if everything was so simple, <coughs> the problem is the following. The Higgs mass itself scales with the mass of the superpartners. So this is, this is a typical mass of a superpartner. And these are the allowed regions of Higgs mass in various supersymmetric theories. As you see, in order to get a Higgs mass as high as, let's say, here, which is the central value of Higgs to measure F, you need superpartners beyond one terra from wall. So what? Why is that a problem? It turns out that supersymmetry is there for, a, for, a, for an important reason. Supersymmetry is there to protect the Higgs uh, against quantum fluctuations. Already, this, these gauge symmetries <coughs> do an amazing work of protecting the force carriers against quantum fluctuations in the standard model. The standard model would simply collapse if gauge symmetries wouldn't do this service. And similarly, there is a set of symmetries, spiral symmetries, which I didn't talk about, which do the same for matter. So <coughs> in, 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 in the standard model, all, all particles are, uh, are cyclic secretly protected by these symmetries. And supersymmetry coming in protects the Higgs mass, the Higgs uh, <coughs> itself from, uh, quantum fluctuations. So this protection works well if the superpartners are below their electron volt. However, I just showed you that this, this high Higgs mass suggest that superpartners are above the problem. And there is a problem. It's, it's called the naturalness problem. And, um, and Doyun and Elliot and Ben are working actually on, on exactly this. So I, I don't want to go more into this. Point is that some people already, um, already uh, turn, are, are turning away from the simplest supersymmetric models because they have this naturalness problem. However, the, uh, the problem itself may not be as simple as we think. So we are, uh, we are, talk we are, we are uh, working on, this, on these things and uh, it's, it, it's to be seen where, where this goes. So I was going to talk about uh, unification stuff. Um, I will jump to the very last slide of, of the unification. So the string theorists uh, tell us that uh, of the at some extremely high scale, there's a huge gauge group which uh, shatters into a smaller um, exceptional group which contains um, an SO10 which, by the way, um, perfectly accommodates the, the standard model particles in the fundamental representation. Um, and then it, it's supposed to break down to SU5 and then the SU5 give us the uh, the, the one, two, three symmetry that we see here. Um, this is absolute um, mathematical um, fiction. 
we know this, but we don't know any of that. However, the fact that now we know that this group actually breaks, the electroweak group breaks into the U1, while, while uh, um, so this way, I, I, I skip towards stuff. By a spontaneous uh, <coughs> symmetry breaking, we know this now because there is a heat. So now that this is this is reality. Now there is one example where a gauge group can actually break spontaneously to a smaller group. So now there is a hope that all this might be uh, real, real in, in the future. It might be physics, not just uh, not just maths. So Higgs uh, boosts unification a lot, and through the Higgs we might get to dark matter. Skipping that. So, so the Higgs is an amazing particle in itself because uh, it completes the standard model. It explains the origin of inertial mass. It allows for unification of the two forces, and now uh, two more to go only. <coughs> so uh, now we have an electroweak theory, and we understand exactly how it works. So go and embed uh, QCD, strong forces and gravity, in an SO10 or larger group, and then you are there. You, you, you have everything. You have the theory of everything. Um, yeah, that's what I said. Um, Higgs, uh, this, this very Higgs signal, in fact, may, may uh, carry the size of supersymmetry in it. And dark matter stuff I skipped. Um, it, 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 the Higgs is, is good for, for everything. Basically, it, it, it affects our, our understanding of, of uh, all aspects of particle physics. So that's why I said it opens the new era. We are in a situation like this. Basically, we are staring at a single Higgs here, and there might be something huge down there. And most of us think there is. Okay, at this point, it's a little <coughs> early to tell what that might be. So finally, this is the entertainment portion of my talk. If you look at this, uh, this, this is in this case is the Atlas Higgs data, then um, those of you who play music might see some, might see these dots as sort of musical notes. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, somebody actually put them on a note sheet <laughs> and uh, realized that it produces uh, this. Admittedly, I did some um, <laughs> some instrumentation, <laughs> but the um, but the data are the original.